So now what I'd like to do is, uh, as I said, to speak a little bit about the Orthodox Church and the Orthodox faith in some general terms. A lot of these things we'll revisit later as we uh, continue through the classes, um, but this is just uh, really a summary, and then as I said, we'll move on to the Nicene Creed. One of the central themes um, that exists throughout the scriptures and is uh, very central to the Orthodox faith, to our worship, to the whole kind of life and understanding of Orthodox Christianity is the theme of communion, communion. Um, so this is, a, this is a very important word for us to understand. And a lot of times people um, just think in terms of like, People think, think in terms of communion as a sacrament, and it certainly is. And we're going to talk about that and how we understand sacraments in general and how we understand communion as a sacrament. But <clears throat> even more broadly, we can speak of communion as, you know, if you think about the etymology of the word, what is it? It's a union with, right? A union with, to be united with. Um, and so, what, are, what or whom are we being united with? Of course, first and foremost, it's with God. But it's also with each other. <clears throat> and really, if we want to say what the purpose of our existence is, why God created us, or what he created us for, he created us for communion. That's the purpose of human existence. For us to be united with God, to have union with God, and to be united with each other. There's really no other reason for there to be this kind of multiplicity of persons in the world than for us to be united in a union of love. Now, according to the world, um, maybe there are lots of other reasons we could talk about for human existence or what, what it's all about. Um, but this is the one that scripture gives us and that our faith teaches us. And, and this is the truth, we say, is that we're created for love and it's to exist in a communion of love with God and with each other. So that's very central to our faith. And <clears throat> there are lots of images for this love. One of the images that scripture uses from beginning to end is the image of marriage. You see, in Genesis, God creates Adam, but it's not good for him to be alone. So he gives him another. And that other is a woman. And she comes from him. And, it, and then she's, Adam says, bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, and they're united in this marriage. But from a Christian perspective, that marriage of Adam and Eve and all marriage is an image of what we find in the New Testament with the bridegroom, the groom, and the bride. And the groom is Christ, and the bride is the church. So really marriage as an institution from the beginning and throughout scripture is pointing to this reality of our union with God. And this is why God in the Old Testament, you know, when, when he's speaking to the people of Israel, um, is always kind of comparing and contrasting his relationship with Israel with a marriage. And, he, and then when Israel starts worshiping idols and, you know, going astray and all of that, he says, like, How, you know, I didn't love you enough. I wasn't a good enough husband that you're now looking for another you know, and betraying and, and all of this. So there's always this comparison um, between the relationship with God and marriage. And then, of course, it continues all the way through. And so the, at the very beginning of Scripture, you have marriage. And at the very end, in the book of Revelation, you know, it's the marriage feast of the Lamb. And so you could say the whole thing is about a marriage. But that's really just an image of this union that God creates us for, to have with him and to have with each other. <clears throat> But of course, our relationship with God is unique. 
And so you have this unique um, bridegroom and bride relationship between Christ and the church. We'll talk a lot more about that later. But the main point I want to make right now is that our purpose is to be united in love. Um, now, that being the case, it goes against reason for us to expect that we can fulfill our calling to, to be in communion with God and with each other um, somehow alone by ourselves. That, that would be totally counterintuitive to say that we're going to be able to do this, to unite with God and to unite with each other and to do it somehow isolated. So if we're not going to do it in a way that's isolated, then how do we do it? Well, we do it with the church. And so the church is, of course, a community. And, and, this, and um, this is just really another form of the word communion, which is a stronger word. Community, you know, people think of like a community center or something like that. Like it doesn't have as strong a, a sense to it when people hear it usually. But, but if you say the church is really a communion, meaning in other words, it is the union of God with man and, and with human beings with one another, um, then that's a very much stronger way of speaking of it. But even in community, you have the same basic uh, meaning of being united together. Um, and there's an old Christian saying that one Christian is no Christian because we're not saved alone. And, and that's a central um, theme and understanding in Orthodox Christianity that we need the church to be saved. We, we need the church, and, and really it's just a matter of logic because again, to be saved means to be part of that communion with God. And, and to be isolated and, and to sort of separate from the body um, is, by definition, not to be in communion. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So um, this is why um, there's a problem from the Orthodox Christian perspective with the very common sort of claim that people make, and I can understand and be sympathetic with it, but the claim that, well, I don't need an institution, you know, or I don't like organized religion. I can have a relationship with God, and I can do it by going mountain biking in the woods or whatever, you know, and I have a relationship with God, and I don't need, I don't need this sort of institution or organized religion or something like that. Um, I understand that, and certainly um, we do want to have a deep personal connection with God, only we can't even come to that without the help of the whole body. Um, and, and really, that's why we need the church, is because we need, each of us personally, we need the support of the whole body of Christ. And this is what Christ intends for us, which is why when he ascended into heaven, and we'll go back and talk about kind of everything that happened in his ministry and in his life, but when he ascended into heaven and left the disciples behind, he didn't leave them with a book. He didn't have a book. The, the New Testament wasn't even written yet, you know? There was no instruction manual. There's no kind of like 12 easy steps to being a Christian. There's nothing like that. He left them with a community. That's exactly what he left them with, was the church. They, they were uh, the church. And, um, and he said that, that through the church, the Holy Spirit would guide them into all truth. Um, so, one Christian is no Christian. We need the community of the church. Um, we can't find salvation by ourselves because salvation means being united in communion with God and with all our brothers and sisters. We find salvation together as members of the one body of Christ. There is one Christ and one body, and we are all, every human being, called to be members of that one body, members of the household of God, as it says in Ephesians. Now, as Orthodox Christians, we understand that one body to be the Holy Orthodox Church. And this is a very important point uh, for us to make, and we have to understand it the right way. When we say that we believe that the Orthodox Church is the one true church, we're not saying that in such a way that we are judging or despising anyone at all, ever in any possible way. We're saying there's one Christ 
and he has one body because his body cannot be divided um, and that we believe that that body has a real concrete historical existence and and that that existence that historical concrete existence is found in the Orthodox Church and that every single human being is called to be a part of that one body and we would say along with that that we are called as Christians to love every single human being as a brother or sister and to want every single human being to be a part of that one body and to think of every person as dear to us and dear to Christ. So we could think of the Orthodox Church from an Orthodox perspective as the one beautiful, joyful celebration of um, the kingdom on earth that all people are called to. And here I think of the, prodig the, the parable of the prodigal son. Are you all familiar with the parable of the prodigal son? You've heard this uh, story before. Um, just very briefly, there's a father, as the Lord Jesus tells this parable. There's a father, he has two sons. The younger son says, I want my inheritance now, which is kind of like saying, I want you dead. I want what's mine. I don't want you, I want your stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. I want it now. Um, the father very lovingly, very gently says, okay. He, he gives the younger son his inheritance. And this is really striking to me. He doesn't stop him. He lets him go. He goes. He squanders it all. He wastes it all. He ends up in a pig's pen. He doesn't have anything to eat. And he's like out of his mind. Because then it says he, he came to his mind. He came to himself or he came to his senses. And then he returned to his father and he said, I'll just go and I'll, because my father's so good, he takes such good care of his servants in his house, I'll just say, I'm not worthy to be your son, just let me be one of your hired servants. He comes towards his father and before he even gets to his father, the father comes running and embraces him, which is like unheard of in Middle Eastern culture for a man to run to his son. That doesn't happen. And the man stays there and waits for the son to come to him. So this is really striking when Jesus tells this parable, that the father is running to his son, embraces him, you know, kisses him, and it's this incredible scene. Um, and then, what does he do? He throws a party. He throws a feast. He says, yeah, yeah, a feast. This, my son, was dead and he's alive. He was lost and he's found. So we're going to celebrate. So it's this beautiful celebration. And then there's the older brother. And he calls the older brother and says, come to the party. And he says, what? You know, he squandered this son of yours. He doesn't want to ex even accept him as his brother. He squandered everything that you gave him on wasted on prostitutes. You know, I mean, he's really just giving it to him. And... Excuse me. Speaking of children. <laughs> so, so the father invites the older brother and he says, he refuses to come. So here you have an image of the church as this glorious feast that all are invited to. The father is calling all to it both the prodigal son, the one who was a sinner and squandered everything, he's saying, come to, come to the feast. And the older brother, who feels like he always did everything right, um, but now uh, is jealous, he's envious. And so you have this image of, of course, the one who's come and the other one who doesn't want to come. And the father's never going to, um, he doesn't negotiate with terrorists. Okay? And the older brother is being a terrorist. He's saying, I'll only come on my terms. That's not how it works. The door is always open. You're always welcome. I love you and I want you to be there. But I don't negotiate with terrorists. And that's just how it is. And that's how God is with us. The door is always open. The church is always open. It's, it's there for everyone. The feast is, the banquet is there for everyone. Um, but we have to come humbly. There's no other way. You see, the prodigal son came humbly. He's, I don't even deserve to be a son. And then there was joy for him. You know, the father said, I rejoice. You, you are my son. He gave him a ring and everything. So this is an image for us of the church. That we're, we're all called to this banquet. And, um, 
every person is either already participating in the banquet, at least to some degree, or on the way to participating, or actively refusing to participate. This is how we, we see it, you know? Um, that's, again, that's an image. Even the actively refusing ones, we don't hate or reject. Rather, we pray that they will change their minds and join the celebration. That's it. We pray in the liturgy for the union of all men. In the divine liturgy that we pray every Sunday and feast days and everything, we pray for the union of all men. Men and women, human beings, without exception. We pray and hope for every person to ultimately find the way to Christ and to his body. And we're going to speak more later about differences between Orthodox Christianity and other Christian groups um, as, as those things kind of come up. Um, we'll also talk more about how we understand the church and how we think about those who are not in the church. But for now, I simply want to make the point that our church teaches us to love all without exception and to pray for all and to, and to desire the salvation of all and at the same time to know and love the Holy Orthodox Church as the one and only true church and the, the place of our salvation. Um, to which all people are called to belong. And this is really significant because we say God is God and he can do anything he wants and he can work outside of whatever boundaries he gives us. But he does give us boundaries um, where we uh, know that we can find a place of safety and refuge and shelter. And, and we say that's what the church is for us. So can the Holy Spirit work in the lives of people, would we say, outside of the Orthodox Church? Absolutely. Absolutely. We don't limit the Holy Spirit, okay? Um, but we say that we know that God has provided a place of refuge for us and a place of um, where there's a secure foundation and clear teaching and all of these things. And that's where, if you get to know it well enough, there's no other place you'd want to be, you know, because this is where you find um, the way of living in God and being transformed by Him. And then if you find that, you don't want anything else. Um, so we say we found this in the church. So just very basically, what do we mean when we use these terms, church and orthodox? I think it's important just to kind of define the terms because people have all kinds of ideas. And a lot of times when you tell somebody you're Orthodox, they say, so you're Jewish? You know, no, you know, um, you have to explain that. So, first of all, what's the church? Does anybody know the Greek word for church? Uh, is that ecclesia? Yes, ecclesia. Okay which comes from the, the Greek word for call, or to call, um, kalau, and like called out. Um, and so what it is, is it refers to the gathering of the people that God has called out. So a lot of times it's translated as an assembly. You know, God's assembly, his people, that he's called to be his own special people. You know, this is very biblical language that we use, God's own special people. And in the Old Testament, this term, um, translated into Greek, uh, is, it refers to Israel. This term is, is used for God's people, Israel. There's a, a Greek translation of the Old Testament from Hebrew into Greek. It's called the Septuagint. And if you read the Old Testament in the Septuagint, it uses this word a lot for Israel. This is God's people that he calls. Um, of course, w we say that the church is the new Israel. So it's a continuation. There's continuity between the Israel of the Old Testament and the church in the New Testament and um, to up till now. And that, so the church is Israel, and um, that's God's people. That's, that's his assembly that he's called. Now, we also say, again, that while the church is unique, it's God's own special people, while he's he sort of called it to um, have a unique role and so on, again, ultimately, he wants it's that all human beings might be a part of this. And we see this even in the Old Testament with Israel. God's, God calls this people, they're unique, they're special, they're not like the Gentiles, right? But then he says, you know, in the prophecy in Genesis is, 
that you might be a light to the Gentiles. He calls them to be separate so that later on they might prepare the way for the whole world, that everybody might know him through them. So this is the role of the church, that it's, it exists for the world, for the life of the world and its salvation, we say. Now, what about Orthodox? So we say, you know, the church has, in a sense, existed from the Old Testament, and then continuing through the New Testament, we say from the, the day of Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit, the church was baptized, and it exists down to our own day. But, of course, if you live in Shreveport, Louisiana, or anywhere around here in the United States, you can look in the yellow pages of uh, church, and you find, like, thousands of different kinds of churches, right? So, wait a minute, what? We said there's one church and all of this. Um, so here we come to the term Orthodox. What do we mean by that? And um, really, the, the term, its meaning um, just, uh, again, the, the word itself, um, ortho is like orthodontic, right? That's, it's the same root. It means straight. You know, the orthodontist makes your teeth straight. Orth, so ortho means straight or right. Usually it's translated as right. And then the docs part. And, and here, um, it's related to two different words in Greek. Um, and, and the way you hear it uh, in Greek, it's, it sounds like it e could either mean teaching or doctrine, and also glory or worship. And this is significant because we say our faith is not only, although it's part of, it's partly this is true, it's about uh, having the right teaching, the right doctrine, the right understanding about Christ and his church and so on. That's true. We, we say that we have that in our faith. But we also say that's closely connected with how we worship. And worship is connected with doctrine. You can't have one separate from the other. And we say that our, our life as Christians is all about worshiping God. So you could have the right doctrine, but if you don't apply it in the way you worship God, um, then you, you miss the point, and vice versa. So we say that um, orthodoxy is both about having the correct teaching and about the right way of worshiping. Now, what do we mean by right? Um, we don't mean that you know somehow we did a, a mathematical proposition and we figured it out on our own somehow rationalistically. Uh, we don't mean that, you know, this is just something that, that we made up and we think we're better than everybody else or something like that. Nothing like that. We say this is what existed from the time of the apostles and has been handed down generation after generation and that we haven't changed, essentially. Now, if you look at the liturgy and you study the history of the liturgy and everything, you'll find there are things that slowly developed over centuries, you know, that like this prayer showed up at this time and everything like that. But if you look at the way worship was done in the first couple of centuries and the way it's done today in the Orthodox Church, you can see that it's essentially the same. <clears throat> and along with that, I mean, we say that the Holy Spirit exists in the life of the Church so that whatever developments or clarifications, for example, in doctrine, have come to pass, those have been guided by the Holy Spirit. So, for example, today in the Orthodox Church, um, those who are here for liturgy heard about this. We commemorate the Fourth Ecumenical Council. That took place in the year 451 in Chalcedon, which is right next to, um, close to Constantinople in um, modern-day Turkey. So in 451, there was this big council. There were a whole bunch of bishops, and they all came together, and they made this very, very important decision, which is accepted, whether they realize it or not, by almost all Christians today, the decision of this council, okay? Um, but at the time, there was a very real controversy, and it had to do with Jesus Christ and whether he's human or God, okay? So there's a big controversy because some people were saying, Jesus Christ, he took humanity, but because divinity is so powerful, the humanity was like a drop of wine in the ocean. And so it just kind of gets, like, dispersed. So basically, he has a divine nature that sort of absorbs the humanity. This was one position. 
and it's it's held to this day to some degree by certain people but the council decided no that's not the case why because Jesus Christ while remaining fully divine he becomes fully human and his humanity is real and if that weren't the case then we wouldn't be saved because he has to become everything that we are in order to share divinity with humanity and unite the, the divine and the human because he unites divinity and humanity in himself we have the real possibility of partaking of the divine nature as St. Peter says and, and our whole Christian faith depends on this reality so this is this is extremely important um, for our faith but this is something that isn't clearly let's let's put it like this it's it's it exists in scripture it's throughout scripture but not in so many words you have to interpret scripture in order to get this understanding and so the formula of the council was Jesus Christ is one person in two natures but you don't find that formula in the Bible you can look everywhere and you don't find that so you can read the Bible and you can interpret it a lot of different ways and people again have everybody the, the ones who said that he absorbed the humanity into his divinity they were reading the same Bible and getting that from it you know so we say that um, there is a certain development over time where you have these councils but that the whole process is guided by the Holy Spirit and um, we're gonna get to the Nicene Creed in a moment um, and basically this is the faith which uh, was clearly defined in the fourth century by these councils um, that has been accepted to this day by vast majority of Protestant Christians and Catholics and everybody um, but it comes from uh, this life of the Orthodox Church now w when did we start sort of using this word to describe the church it was in the course of those early centuries when there was there were these controversies with different heretical groups who were teaching different things that the fathers of the church started using that word to describe the, the position that they believed was in line with the apostles. That we're saying, we believe that we're holding on to the apostolic faith that's been passed down to us, and that is the orthodox faith. It's, it's right doctrine, it's, it's the one that's connected with right worship, and we're not veering to the right or to the left, but we're staying on the, the true path. So that's how that word developed, but it really comes into play and becomes kind of like an official designation for what we call the church from the time of the Great Schism, which uh, took place. It developed over a few centuries, but the date that's usually given is 1054 between the Church of Rome and the rest of the church. Um, and we'll, again, we'll talk more about how that happened, why that happened, what took place and everything like that. But just very briefly, you have um, in the ancient church various local churches that are all united. By, you know, they're, they're a single church, but they exist in um, sort of local communities. And you have m major cities within the Christian world, including Rome, Constantinople, Jer Antioch, uh, Alexandria and North Africa and Jerusalem. Those those five were known as um, the they were the patriarchates in the early church. Now we have uh, additional patriarchates since then, but those were the most important cities in the ancient church. And and so then um, eventually, and again we'll go into this more later. But um, the Pope, who was the patriarch of Rome, for various reasons, um, broke from the other patriarchs. Um, anathematized them and it's it's complicated because there's sort of one one pope died and anyway we'll, we'll get into that later but it just developed unfortunately that the Church of Rome broke from the rest of the churches and when that took place then you have this new designation of the Roman Catholic Church which is that one under Rome and then all the rest of the local churches which remained in communion with one another um, and uh, came to call themselves the Orthodox Church. In other words, the ones who didn't break away and form a new church. So that's where that term comes from. And so we use this kind of uh, terminology of one holy Orthodox Church. But 
it refers to the same um, church that we speak of in the creed as apostolic. And we'll get to that in a minute. Okay. And I think it's important to uh, point out um, just scripturally that, and, and this sometimes take, takes people by surprise if they haven't really thought about this passage, but in 1 Timothy 3.15, St. Paul refers to the church as the pillar and ground of the truth. And so sometimes you can kind of... Um, um, surprise people by saying, well, according to scripture, what's the pillar and ground of the truth? And if they aren't thinking of that passage, they'll say, well, maybe the Bible, you know? Um, or, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll uh, just kind of guess something. Um, but in fact, what St. Paul says is that it's the church of the living God that is the pillar and the ground of the truth. In other words, it's from the church that we have established what is true. And we would say that the Bible itself is the book of the church. You know, it's, it's kind of a, a written uh, record of the teaching that's been passed down from generation to generation in the church. So like I said before, when Christ ascended into heaven, he left his disciples with the body of the church, but they didn't have a book yet. Of course, they had the Old Testament scriptures, but the New Testament didn't exist yet. Um, so we say that God acts through his church to establish us in the truth and through the truth to set us free. <clears throat> and now I'm going to mention um, four points about the church that are made very clearly in this book by Clark Carlton. And this is um, the faith. Uh, it's a catechism. It's one that I always recommend to our um, catechumens uh, and ask them to read, um, which you know, is a good summary of, of our faith. Um, and so Clark Carlton in this book makes these four points and articulates them very well so I, I like to use his um, wording of these points so he says the Orthodox Church understands herself to be the one true church and this claim is based on four main points that we can identify put them up here So the first point, um, which supports the claim that um, the Orthodox Church is the, the one true church, is the body of Christ, is that the Orthodox Church has maintained an unbroken historical continuity with the early church, the Church of the Apostles. So historical continuity. I have a friend who is a pastor of a church. Um, he was at a, at a um, fairly well-known church here in Shreveport, and uh, we were having lunch one time, and uh, he's somebody who's done, he, he did missionary work in Russia. So he became familiar with the Orthodox Church through trying to missionize the Russians. And and um, and he came to respect it, although he didn't convert. But he said one thing that I really respect and admire about the Orthodox Church is that you have history. He says our history goes back to the 1800s, you know, um, of his denomination, and he recognized that. And um, and so that's that's what we're saying here is that the Orthodox Church has unbroken historical continuity for 2,000 years from the early church until today. The second point is that the Orthodox Church has faithfully maintained the apostolic deposit. Now this is so in other words, not only do we have historical continuity because we could we, you could say, well, you know, a lot of organizations have historical continuity, you know, but they change things over time, right? But not only do we have the historical continuity, but we also have maintained what was passed down to us. And this is really, you know, in the New Testament, um, the Greek word 
for tradition is used many times, although in some translations, uh, if people don't like the word tradition, because it sounds like a bad word to them, when it's used in a good sense, they don't say tradition. They say something like this, like what was handed down, the deposit or whatever. It's the same word in Greek. But if it's, but if it's the traditions of men or something negative, then they say tradition. Well, that's a selective way of translating. Um, but this is what we're talking about. And when we talk about tradition, that's what we mean, is what was handed down from the apostles until our own time. So we're saying um, that exists in the Orthodox Church. The traditions that were handed down from the time of the apostles. Uh, and a great uh, passage from the New Testament to, to, to kind of uh, correspond with this idea is 2 Thessalonians 2.15, uh, where St. Paul... Uh, is saying to hold fast to um, what you've received, whether by word of mouth or our epistle. So he kind of says, whether you've received this in a written form or in a spoken form, hold fast to it. Don't let it go. You know, so we say there, there was much that was written and there was much that wasn't, or eventually it was, but at first it wasn't, and, and that's all part of the apostolic deposit. The third point, is that um, the worship of the early church is maintained in the Orthodox Church. So, um, and I, I tell, you know, a lot of times I'll do a wedding or something and people who aren't Orthodox will come up to me afterwards and say, that was such a beautiful wedding that you did. And I'll say, yep, and I didn't make up any of it. You know, it's like, has no thanks to me, because it's just what I received. I do the wedding just as it says in the book, you know. Um, and yes, it's beautiful, and, um, but it, it's the worship that has existed. And as I said, it's developed in certain ways, but essentially, it's just what you would find if you went into um, a, a gathering of early Christians. So we would say that, you know, um, uh, you can transport a Christian from, I don't know, the second century in uh, uh, Asia Minor to St. Nicholas on Sunday here in Shreveport, Louisiana, and they would recognize what we're doing. And they would say, like, well, that hymn is new, you know, or something like that. But they would say, but the outline, everything, it's, it's just the way we worship. This is how we worship. They would, they would recognize that as Christian worship. Um, and we say that that's uniquely the case with Orthodox worship. And um, the fourth point is that the church has the saints. So, I mean, how is that an argument that the Orthodox Church is indeed the body of Christ? Well, um, because we say it works, that it, it transforms human beings and makes them holy. And that's really what we're called to, is holiness. Um, and we can't manufacture it ourselves at all. Um, and this goes back to what I said before about communion. The purpose of the church is for us to exist in communion with God. And when we exist in communion with God, we receive from Him as a gift His holiness, which transforms us and makes us holy. And the saints are a proof that that happens. Because you can look at them, and you can look at their lives, and you can see how they lived and, and how they died, and you can see that that's possible. St. Athanasius the Great, who was a bishop in the 4th century in uh, Alexandria in Egypt, he wrote the book um, called uh, On the Incarnation, about Christ's becoming human and suffering on the cross. And he goes through it and he explains all of why he became human, why he had to die on the cross, why it couldn't be any other way. You know, it's, it's a really beautiful explanation of all of that. But in this book, and he's kind of writing uh, against certain, you know, pagans and people who would um, try to uh, refute Christianity and, and that kind of thing. And one of the proofs he gives for, for the truth of Christianity is that the martyrs are not afraid of dying. He says, if Christ hadn't risen from the dead, if all of this weren't real, if the resurrection weren't real, then you wouldn't have all these countless people who go to their death 
without fear, who are, who are willing to be tortured and to die and all of these things. He says, the fact that you have these people willing to do that is proof that God's grace is real and that the resurrection is real. So they wouldn't do it for any other reason. In other words, if they weren't inspired by that reality, and if it weren't a real reality, if it were just a figment of their imagination, it, it wouldn't, it wouldn't, nobody would do that. And um, another famous saying um, from the early church is from Tertullian, who's an early Christian um, writer. He says, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Um, we're going to talk a lot more about martyrs and about saints and different categories of saints and so on. But I'm just mentioning that because um, it's very much connected with this idea of, you know, you can't have the church without the saints. In other words, um, uh, it's, it's the communion of God's people with God. You can't have a communion with, of God's people with God if you don't have God's people. And so, but we say the saints uh, are, are show us what it means to be God's people. And so you have uh, these countless people who would see, for example, you know, they'd see somebody being tortured and, you know, dying for Christ. And you have all these people in the crowd and they're, they're watching. And I always have the image of like a brave heart, you know, William Wallace. And you know, have you all seen that? You know, he's being tortured and all of that. And you have all these people watching. But in all of these accounts of the martyrdoms of these countless people, there are always conversions that take place at the martyrdom. You say, why is that? Because they see that this person has something worth dying for. And they say, I want that. Whatever that person has going on, I want that. And so you have all these people who just convert like in that moment and sometimes they immediately become martyrs, you know? So then like all these other people say, I'm a Christian and then they kill them. I'm a Christian and they kill them. And um, I think it's hard in our culture um, to, to even relate to that because we have it easy in our culture. We don't think in terms of having something to die for, you know, being willing to die for something. But um, that's a reality of Christianity throughout the ages, that you have martyrs who are willing to die for the faith. All right. Um, so all of these points that I've made will come up again um, as we talk about different things uh, throughout our later sessions. Um, but I want to turn now and spend a few minutes talking about the creed. And again, this is something that we'll go through in greater detail later. But just as a summary of what we believe, I think this is the this is kind of the most basic way to do that, is to look at the creed. And we say here, and you, Cheryl, you have to remind me, you, you, you told me a Latin phrase. Do you remember what that was? Yes. Okay. I, I believe uh, in order to understand. Yeah. But there's another Latin phrase. And that's very true. You know, we, our faith informs our rational understanding. Um, and um, this is something that we find in Orthodoxy and that we were talking about before, is that our rational understanding is limited. It can only go so far, you know. Um, there are many of these things that we can't explain in a rational way. So we have to recognize the limitations of our reason and say, well, um, God is beyond that. So we talk about God as a mystery, and our faith is a mystery. And this is something that will, again, be a theme that will come up again and again. So... I believe so that I can understand is true. But there's another Latin saying that I want to mention here. And um, you, don't have to, you don't have to learn it in Latin, but just the idea. And this is lex orandi, lex, and sometimes it has s, credendi. And, and this means simply the law of worship or prayer is the law of faith. So what we're saying is, if you want to know what we believe, go to the liturgy and listen to what we're saying. Because all the words that we use in our worship are, are the words of our doctrine. And it's one and the same. And again, I think this is more true in orthodoxy than anywhere else. Although, you know, you could go to any church probably and get a pretty good idea of what they believe from what they're saying in the service but um, we have such a rich uh, tradition of um, prayers 
and hymns. Um, it's, it's an incredible uh, treasury of, of, of our faith that's expressed poetically in worship. So um, really, if you go to the liturgy, you go to other services, and you just listen to the hymns, they're so rich theologically, and you'll, you'll get a strong uh, sense and understanding of what our faith is all about from that. Um, and so the creed, this, this uh, is the Nicene Creed that I just passed out to you. Nicene comes from um, the city of Nicaea, and it's named for that because it was in Nicaea that the first ecumenical council, and ecumenical means worldwide, it was like the first worldwide official council of Christians uh, that was called together from the, in the time of the Byzantine Empire um, in the city of Nicaea. And, and that was in 325. I don't expect you to necessarily memorize all this information right now, but just to know that this took place at a council in 325 in Nicaea, which Nicaea, again, is near Constantinople in modern-day Turkey, Istanbul. Um, and at this council, they were dealing with the question of whether, this was before the other council I was telling you about, and the, and the, and the question was, okay, we believe in one God, and we say the Father is God, but then we have Jesus Christ, who's the Son of God, but then we say He's God, how can we do that? <laughs> How can we have God the Father is the one God and Jesus Christ is the Son of God, but also God? In what sense is He God if we have one God, right? Are we saying that there are two gods? You know, what are we saying here? So it was, it was um, the, all these uh, bishops and priests and lay people from throughout the church gathered together in Nicaea to talk about this and to try to come to a decision. And specifically, there was this man named Arius who was claiming that um, Jesus Christ was a creature, and not God. Um, created thing. Created thing, yeah. Um, which is not true. He takes on a created humanity, but he himself is truly God. And so this council established that, and they began the work of clearly stating what we believe about the Father and the Son. And, and at first they just said, we believe in the Holy Spirit, and that's all they said. And then they said a little bit about the church and so on. And then at the next council, which was in 381 in um, Constantinople, then they completed this creed because they added more about the Holy Spirit and clarified some other things. So, um, but it, it still retains the name of Nicaea, so it's called the Nicene Creed. And it hasn't been changed in the Orthodox Church since that second council in 381. It's the same creed that we, st and we say this at every liturgy and in several other services that we do, and people say it in their morning and evening prayers at home, um, because what we, we pray what we believe, you know? So this is part of our prayers to say the creed, and you say it like a prayer to God. I believe in you, you know, I believe in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and all of these things. So let's just go through this. Um, we won't, we'll wrap up soon, so we won't uh, spend a lot of time talking about everything in detail. Um, but we'll come back to it later <clears throat> and talk in more detail about what it all means. So in the first uh, article, we say, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. So we're saying there's one God, there's the Father Almighty, He's the one God, He's the maker of heaven and earth. Um, so in other words, He created everything. You know, visible and invisible. What's invisible? Well, the angels, for example, spiritual realities. Um, and, and what's visible? Well, the, the world that we live in, you know, the sky and trees and balloons and everything. Um, <laughs> right? So one God, maker of heaven and earth and everything. Everything. But now we, we're going to come to kind of a paradox here. But So in the next article we say, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, okay? He's one person, we say. The Son of God, the only begotten, this is scriptural language, begotten of the Father before all worlds. 
this is another way of saying in some translations is before eight all ages you know like before time began basically it's another way of saying there was never a time when there was no son of god he has always existed together with the father so we say he's co-eternal with the father just as the father is eternal and always existed so the son has always existed okay begotten of the father before all worlds he's begotten that's the scriptural language we can't explain exactly what that means it's not like human beginning it's a divine beginning um, and is unique to him. Light of light, very God of very God. Okay, here the fathers were making it really clear. They're making the point in, in different ways that he's really God. <laughs> he's not sort of God. He's not a demigod. He's not like Hercules or something you know, from Zeus. It, not, nothing like that. He is totally what his father is. And they would say, you know, it's just like us, you know. Kale is a human because his father is a human, you know. And if his father was a horse, he'd be a horse. But that's not the case, you know. And we say the same thing. The father is God and the son is God in the same way. He's, his nature is exactly what his father's is. Does that make sense? Very God of very God. Truly, very means truly. Truly God of, of true God begotten not made okay we're going to say it several different ways to leave out any doubt you know there's no no doubt that he's truly god not made of one essence with the father and this was a huge controversy because this word um, in greek that we translate there as one essence it's one word in greek homo which means the same Usios, homo usios, which means, usios means substance or essence. So, um, same substance. In other words, the same nature, same kind of thing. And this was a big controversy, and you know why? Because it's not in the Bible. They said, this is the argument. Some of the fathers started saying this in order to be clear, but other fathers of the church uh, objected because they said, we don't find this in scripture. It doesn't say homo usios. He said, even though it doesn't use the word, it's clear if you, if you read it all in context and, and interpret it correctly. So this argument went back and forth, back and forth, but finally they said, yes, although it's not used in scripture, it is a way of summarizing what scripture says and it is in fact true and so we have this it's a very important theological word because what it means is that again Jesus Christ is the same thing as the father um, not just something similar but indeed he's he has the same nature as the father and then we have this uh, also amazing phrase after that by whom all things were made we said before that the Father made all things, and now we're saying the Son, by whom all things were made. So, which is it? You know, who created the world? The Father or the Son? Yes. Yes. That's the Orthodox answer. You, you get it. That's the Orthodox answer. It's a mystery. It's, it's yes. It's yeah. paradox. It's paradox. It's mystery. But there are many things like that in the Orthodox faith where we say, is it this or is it that? And the answer is yes. Um, because the, the theological language that the church uses is, uh, and again, scriptural, is that the Father creates the world through the Son or by the Son and in the Holy Spirit. It's so beautiful um, the way that's phrased. But in other words, it's by His Word that the Father creates. He speaks everything into existence. And Jesus Christ is the Word. So it's by the Word that the Father creates. <clears throat> Has anybody read the Chronicles of Narnia? Mm -hmm. Okay. In the Chronicles of Narnia, um, Aslan, who represents Christ, sings everything into existence. It's so beautiful the way it describes it. He's just like walking back and forth on the earth and he's singing and as he's singing, trees start coming up and the grass and the rocks and the mountains and everything. He sings everything into existence. The um, Cimmerillion? The Cimmerillion. Again, it's music. Yes. Yeah. And, and the 
the angels and others are doing things, and then there's the discord, you know, the, the discord yes, from the is, evil one. Yeah, yes, uh -huh. very, and then he just he just he weaves that in. Yeah, yes. yeah. Yes. He uses the evil even for good. All right. Um, okay, so let's just continue through this, not taking too much more time. Mm -hmm. Who for us men and for our salvation? Now, before it was just talking about Christ, the Word of God in His eternal being, and then how He creates the world, and now it's going to begin talking about how He enters into the world through His incarnation. Who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate, in other words, He became flesh, of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and was made man. We'll talk more about that incarnation because that's so central for us, um, but we won't spend a lot of time right now. And was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate and suffered and was buried. So this is a summary of the life of Christ in this world and how he suffered for us and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures. And specifically, according to the scriptures means according to the Old Testament. In other words, he fulfilled the prophecies. He is the one who fulfilled the prophecies. When, when you have scriptures used like this, at this point in church history, it's always it's referring to the Old Testament. In the early centuries, that's what scriptures meant. And ascended into heaven, after he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth or sits at the right hand of the Father. And that's just straight out of the gospel. And he shall come again with glory to judge the living and the dead. He'll come again. There will be a second coming, we believe, when he'll come to judge the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. Now, you'll notice it, what it says about the second coming is very brief. And there's no speculation about when that's going to happen or exactly, you know, all of these kinds of things that people like to speculate about. None of that is there, and that's really absent from Orthodox tradition because Jesus himself said, nobody knows the, the day or the hour, and not even I know, but only the Father, right? So, so don't waste your time. Um, whose kingdom shall have no end. This is a, a, a point that um, it's connected with the idea of the rapture. Y'all are familiar with the doctrine of the rapture? Well, this is basically a refutation from... 381 uh, of, of that idea of a thousand year reign of Christ in this world and that was actually something that some people believed at that time was that Jesus when he came again because it says in the book of Revelation there will be a, uh, he'll reign for a thousand years right that he will establish his kingdom here on earth reign for a thousand years and then will be the beginning of the final age and he'll you know take us to heaven and all of that um in this, in, so this sentence is basically saying that's not true. When he comes, it'll be his kingdom, and that'll be it. There's no thousand-year reign in this world. I don't, that, that might just um, not connect with anything you've heard before, but some people believe that to this day, um, and the church already dealt with that a long, long time ago. Um, <clears throat> and I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father... This is what the Gospel of John says. The Son is begotten of the Father, and the Spirit proceeds from the Father. Now, how do we explain the difference between those things? We don't. That's just what it says. That's what the Apostle says. That's what we say. The Son is begotten, the Holy Spirit proceeds from. There's a difference in each of their relationship with the Father, but we can't uh, dissect that difference. To use that word that we were talking about, Cheryl. It's, that's a mystery, and Scripture doesn't expound on that, and we don't either. Um, there are some things we can say, but there's, there's a lot that we can't say about that. But here I also have to mention something called the Filioque, which was an addition that was made to the Creed um, a few centuries after um, these councils. It was first introduced, I think, maybe in the 500s, um, and slowly, very slowly, it came to be accepted um, in Rome and in the West, this, this word is a Latin word, filioque, which means and the sun. It was an addition made to the creed 
in the West, and this was one of the disagreements between the Church of Rome and the Orthodox Church, and it was right here, where who proceeds from the Father, and then they put in, and the Son. I'm not going to go into detail right now, but that addition was a big problem for the Orthodox Church, because A, it's not in Scripture, and B, it's not right. It's, it's really theologically problematic. And we'll talk, when I talk more about the Trinity, I'll talk about why that's a problem. Um, but for now, suffice it to say, we don't accept that addition, and so we say the Creed just in its original form. Then going on, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified. In other words, the Holy Spirit's also God, just like the Son and the Father. Who sp spake or spoke by the prophets. So the Holy Spirit is the one who speaks by the prophets, inspires the prophets, in other words, to speak the word of God. And I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. And when we talk more about the understanding of the church will go through each of those terms and what they mean. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. In a nutshell, that's our faith. That's what we believe. We say it at every liturgy, as I said, and in our prayers at home and so on. Um, and basically, there's there are volumes packed into this very concise statement. Um, so there's a lot more that we can say, but that's at least um, so you can begin being familiar with what all is here, what we're saying, why we're saying it, and so on. Um, so I want to end with my spiel here and just ask if you all have any uh, questions for me based on anything that I said or anything related. questions really well um, you all I think you all have my email and you're always welcome if um, you know I say something that's confusing and you just don't want to ask at the time or you think of it later or whatever um, feel free to email me and and uh, ask your question or ask for further explanation and uh, um, it might be something that would be worth bringing up at the next class just to clarify for everyone so uh, feel free to email me or to call and let me know if you do have questions. So, and the Son is the difference between the Apostles' Creed and the Nazi Creed? No, the Apostles' Creed um, doesn't say that. Okay. Um, the Apostles' Creed is also an Orthodox Creed, although we don't use it in the services. But it's an early creed um, that's accurate. It's just not maybe as accurate or as full as the Nicene Creed, which is why we prefer to use the Nicene Creed. That, that's the one that entered into the liturgy. Um, this filioque is in the, in the Roman Catholic and Western, generally, version of the Nicene Creed. Okay. That's just an insertion that was added to the Creed that we say doesn't belong there. And, you know, I grew up in the Episcopal Church, for example, and... Um, we said the, the creed with the filioque in the Episcopal Church because they received it from the Roman Catholic Church. So any of the Western denominations that use the creed probably have the filioque because they got it from the Roman Catholic Church. The Methodists use the uh, Apostles' Creed. They use the, the Apostles' Creed, yeah. In the Episcopal Church, we use both. We would say the Apostles' Creed at certain points and the Nicene Creed at certain points. So, yeah. All right. Let's end with a prayer.